morning, and I'm glad to see each of you men here this morning. It's already been a great morning, very, uh, very uh, revealing and helpful to find out some things about Brother J.D. Howe is from, what did you say, Puerto Rico? And that's why he has a short haircut. Is that what he said? Something like that. And I'm glad to know that Brother Willette was not kissing that five-foot girl. I've always wondered about that, so thank you for clarifying that. And yeah. <laughs> And uh, anyways, when you, when you come to a session and it's like 5.30 California time, you get it all mixed up, you know, so, uh, but uh, that was a tremendous, wasn't that a blessing, that first session? Um, and I've really always appreciated Brother Willette. I know uh, I have some friends that, uh, because he's got this deep voice and he, you know, says, gets up and says stuff about not having Sunday night church or whatever, uh, some people think, man, that guy is probably scary to talk to and mean, and, and uh, then you get around him and you realize he has a heart and... Yeah. Uh, he has an ear to listen, and uh, his position is really well thought out, and I always appreciate a lesson like that. And so if you would, take your Bible this morning, and, and uh, as you're uh, finding that, I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind just standing for a moment, and we'll read just one scripture from Matthew chapter 5. And uh, I, we do have some books in the back, and, and um, uh, I want to just mention a couple of the newer ones. Uh, how many of you have already received a copy of Outsiders? Let me see. Have any of you received that? Not very many of you, so let me encourage you, if you don't have this book, we have a good number of them. This is our newest book. Uh, it, it deals with 15 leaders who followed Christ and changed their world. And I really enjoyed writing this over a number of years. I had the privilege of uh, visiting a lot of the, uh, the places where they preached and died and printed the Bibles. And uh, this uh, really, in the, in the first part of the book, is a challenge to all of us to uh, truly be willing to step outside of the cultural and religious norms of our day in order to make a difference. The men and women who have changed the world are the men and women the world could not change. And that's the premise of the book. So Peter Waldo, John, uh, John Wycliffe, John Huss, Felix Manns, William Tyndale, Latimer and Ridley, Patrick Hamilton, John Bunyan, John Newton, mostly all Baptists, a few of the reformers, uh, some life lessons, some questions at the end of each chapter. Uh, I had a group of young people in our church read this book this summer, and uh, about uh, 150 of them read it, and then they wrote a little report, and then I had a dinner with them, and we had some testimonies. And you should have heard the junior and senior hires just giving testimonies about, I didn't know people died so we could have the Bible, and uh, I didn't realize that prayer was so effective. And they learned that from... from uh, uh, George Mueller and, you know, just things like that. And so Outsiders is a, is a great resource. I, I think it would be an encouragement to you. Uh, lots of other things back there. I'll just mention one or two more. Revival Today is a great daily devotional. Dr. Getch uh, wrote this. Just, uh, again, I have about three or four daily devotionals that I like to read about church history, revival, uh, different, different little things that are helpful to me to start my day, things that I might be able to use later in the day. And this is a good one if you don't have it. Lots of music. This is our college choir singing on the steps of the state capitol last spring. You will reign. Good conservative music. Pray for our uh, college. Many of, We have several graduates here this morning. It's good to see you men. Uh, appreciate your encouragement. Uh, we need now more than ever labors for the harvest. Jesus had one prayer request. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into his harvest. So let's be praying for labors. And, uh, and pray for West Coast, and we appreciate your prayers. When you have a young person that's called to ministry or called to preach, consider uh, sending them out, at least giving them a look. Give them the chance, give the Holy Spirit of God the opportunity to work. And uh, we're excited about what God is doing there and looking forward to seeing continued blessings as we strive together for the faith of the gospel. Well, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, a very familiar passage for us. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And I want to speak today on the subject of the leader's influence, and we're going to talk about letting the light shine. Uh, how many of you want to be an influence for good and for God in this world? Amen. And so this is not a sermon uh, like we heard in the last hour. This is more of a lesson. I've entitled it, The Leader's Greatest Commodity. We'll define that in just a moment. But let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, thank you for this wonderful group of men of God and just for the privilege of gathering with them this morning. We ask that you would bless them, lift their burdens, encourage their hearts, challenge their minds and spirit, Lord, to uh, follow after and to be conformed to 
the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, someone said the trouble with being a leader today is that you're not sure if people are following you or chasing you. Do you ever feel that way as a leader? Uh, it's, uh, it's a challenging day indeed to be a leader. And uh, today I want to speak to you about what we all understand leadership to be, and that is that leadership is influence, it is God-given, it comes with God's uh, anointing on our life, He gives us an opportunity to have some measure of influence in the lives of other people, and that's a great stewardship. That's why it is important that our heart is pure. When the heart uh, is pure, the vision is clear. Uh, none of us want to be guilty of not challenging people where they should be challenged or of overrunning and uh, uh, being roughshod with God's people. These are not our people. These are God's people. And we want to be giving a godly influence in leadership. Now, I use the word the leader's greatest commodity. The word commodity is something useful or valued. It's a service that is uh, widely used. When I think about the greatest commodities that we have, obviously, when I think about our greatest resources, I think of Christ in you, the hope of glory. I think of the Holy Spirit uh, working through us and the Word of God. But all of these in our lives are going to allow us to have and to be the instrument of influence in other people's lives. Now, it's not my power. It's not by my, my, it's not, it's not by my power. It's by the Spirit. We know that. But to be an instrument that could influence someone to consider the gospel, to consider the ministry, to be a better husband, to be a better wife, what an amazing privilege we have to be influencers for good and for God in this world. And when you think about that, you want to use your influence for those purposes. We see people today using their influence for every kind of wickedness known to man. We see people using their influence politically for the wrong directions. Uh, uh, we see people uh, using their influence uh, in the media realms to, uh, to push the edge, push the edge, and promote sin, and, and, uh, and just continually degrading uh, various, various uh, principles that we find in the Word of God. We see today in the religious realm people using their influence, it seems sometimes, to to draw away men unto themselves, yeah. men who are very cunning, men who are very good at writing uh, uh, blog, uh, blogs or uh, with podcasts and wording certain things to yeah. subtly undermine uh, and subtly cast doubt into the minds of young preachers even today. I never thought that I would hear some of the kinds of teaching that I hear uh, about certain uh, hermeneutical methods and uh, defining gospel-centered hermeneutics as uh, a way that if a sermon is not constructed according to this particular methodology, then it's bad preaching. Uh, you know, I, I love a message that's all about the gospel, that comes back to the gospel. We believe in the power of the gospel to change our lives. We should be motivated by the gospel. But if you preach an expository message that simply says despise not prophesyings and uh, uh, throws out some various uh, commandments from the Word of God and you rightly divide that word, I believe personally you've been faithful to the Word of God. And, and so the subtle undertones of some of the teachings and the influencers of the day would say that if you don't do it this way, then, then you're not really preaching uh, the Bible. And uh, certainly we see a lot of reactions and overreactions to various different types of, of uh, ministries. We, we've seen those who perhaps felt that they were involved in uh, a system of performance and moralism, and so they swing way over to what I believe really is hyper-grace today. And I've had young men uh, coming from fundamental colleges telling me that uh, they've discovered grace, and really it's like Brother Willett was talking about the ties. It's, it seems to come back over and over again. And so in their discovery of grace, one man told me that he was reading after certain authors and, and that he doesn't feel any longer that he needs to confess sin to the Lord because uh, 1 John 1, 9, he had a different interpretation for that. He doesn't need to ask forgiveness when he sins. And by the way, the <laughs> fact of the matter is that we, we all know our position in Christ. We know that we're sanctified, we're set apart at the moment of our salvation. But I happen to believe that there's something about living a repentant life that's pleasing to the Lord and, and right for my fellowship with him. So they're, they're on the very fringes of antinomianism. And what I'm saying is that there are men today that are using their influence to draw away disciples, 
Uh, and it's so sad that we can use terms like the gospel and grace and find such division with those very precious terms. But that's what's happening today. And so as we consider the, the world in which we minister, whether the secular or whether in our ministry lives, all of us should have a desire to influence people for good and for God and uh, not, not just for the traditions that maybe we would cherish or the, uh, the, the, uh, the exact methodologies, but I'm speaking about biblical fundamentalism in the sense of our faith once delivered unto the saints and being faithful and true to this. And so let's think about how we can let our light so shine before men that they'll see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. I'm going to give you some practical thoughts about how to uh, have a greater influence for the Lord. And so let's start, first of all, with this idea of maintaining a passion for our work. You know, sometimes those that are influencing in a way that we would disagree with have an effervescence. They have a passion. They have uh, something that, if we're not careful we walk right into the trap of being characterized as the grumpy fundamentalist yes, sir. that is just always mad about something. Yeah. And so a 30-something pastor is like, well, if I got to choose who I'm going to hang out with, you know, uh, I'm going to hang out over here. I believe we've got to really pray, Lord, help me to have the joy and the passion of the ministry uh, that I had when I first started out in the ministry. And you know, sometimes, uh, you know, some of us have been around, around a little bit longer. I've been pastoring the same church nearly uh, 34 years, and I've been through lots of building programs. And how many of you know if all you ever build is an outhouse, the devil's going to fight that, right? Yeah, right. And uh, we just dedicated an awesome building uh, Sunday afternoon and uh, a new uh, bus transportation facility. We can pull buses into the bays and a huge warehouse for our publications ministry. And it was just a blessing. And and, and yet, when you go through all these building programs and all these battles and all this criticism and all of, the, all of these different experiences, it could be easy to just say, forget you people, you know, and just kind of click into a job and check into the job and just, you know, you can lose your joy through those seasons. And, and yet, if we're the old guys that lose our joy, we're going to also lose our ability to influence in this generation. And so the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for there is no uh, work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And in other words, if you're going to stay in the ministry, if you're going to have that name pastor on your door, then you better serve God with all your might, right? And, uh, and just be found faithful to doing what God has called you to do. Let me give you a few thoughts on how to maintain that passion. First of all, remember that everything we're doing is for his glory. Uh, do it all to the glory of God. You know, whether it's a business, whether it's the work of the church, whatever God's called you to do, if you're a layman, if you're a pastor, do it all to the glory of God. I um, got a text this morning from a friend of mine, and he said, hey, I'm, I'm praying for you today. And, and I said, uh, text him back, I said, I'm praying for you, I'm in Michigan preaching. He said, I'm in, I'm in New York getting some investors for some projects we're doing. And, and uh, I just texted him back, I said, hey, we're both doing the work of the Lord today, let's do it all for his glory. And whatever we do, we want to do it for the work of the Lord and for the glory of the Lord. Uh, secondly, we want to remember that every day is from the Lord. Um, this is the day which the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, some of us have pastored now long enough. And Brother Willette, I think about someone, someone asked me the other day, who's your favorite preacher? And, uh, you know, and, and Brother Willette, you're, you're my favorite preacher. I'll tell you that because you're sitting right there. But the truth of the matter is, everybody I was thinking about is dead, right? Right? I think my favorite preacher might have been Tom Malone. But um, I was just trying to think about great preachers. And some of us have been in the ministry long enough to, uh, to have a lot of funeral services. And, and a lot of people younger than me and younger than you. And, you know, when you think about that, and I don't know how many people I prayed with Sunday who have cancer. Not just one or two, probably a half a dozen. I just want to be sure to wake up and say, this is the day the Lord hath made. You know, last, last Sunday, if you're, if you're like me, when Sundays are done, man, you're just depleted, right? I preached four times, uh, counseled all day. My wife teases me on Sunday mornings, leave the house around 6 o'clock, get home about 11. All the staff, when church is over at 7.30 on a Sunday night, they're gone, right? The pastor is usually still there, right? And you're dealing with things and dealing with things. So Terry always says on Sunday morning, she says, uh, I'll see you tonight at 11. Because <laughs> so, that's kind of how it goes. 
and, and it was a long day. And then Monday, uh, I climbed on an airplane real early to go out, go out east and, and uh, just kind of tired and got on a plane and, and uh, not, not necessarily discouraged, just depleted. And so uh, last Sunday uh, at our church, somebody said it was Pastor Appreciation Day, so I had a bunch of little notes from people. And so I'm on that plane, I'm reading all the notes. And one of them's from a 14-year-old boy in our church named Josh Gabison, who's had cancer. He's been fighting it for three years, bone cancer. And he said, Dear Pastor, thank you for being my pastor. I've got the exact note here on the iPad, but he said, Thank you for all of your prayers for me. I covet your prayers. And he said, I'm thanking the Lord that the cancer that remains is just in small clusters now. God is so good. Keep praying for me, Josh. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I'm an idiot. Because I think I have problems. I, look, at if, if I had a little cluster of cancer left, I'd struggle with that. And pray for this boy. I had him sing Sunday morning. I don't know if it's on video. If you can jump online, they'll probably post that message. I preached a message on contentment Sunday morning. And I had him get up and sing at the end of the sermon, the song Blessings. And I'm telling you, the altar call started before that song was finished. And see, things like this remind me of the fact that, you know what, I need to approach every day with the idea, this day's a gift from God. I don't have a guarantee for tomorrow. And and it it helps me to maintain the right passion. Uh, And then remember also to disengage, as the Lord would have you to. Um, You know, the seventh day is, is the Sabbath, and of course... Uh, we're busy in ministry, and I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, but the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, come apart into a desert place. Um, You know, some of us grew up in an era of fundamentalism where sometimes having a day off was made fun of and so forth, and and I, I, I get around preachers, and I mean, they're, they're taking lots of days off, and you know, they have so many hobbies. And I, I'm, I'm not advocating just goofing off, but sometimes the best way to get your passion back is to get a good night's rest. And so maintain your passion for the work. Secondly, uh, if, we're gonna, if we're going to have the influence that we need to have in the ministry, this is very basic. But let me just uh, quickly say, maintain a planned calendar. You know, busyness is not uh, the mark of accomplishment. And a lot of men are busy and they're doing stuff, but they're not always doing the right stuff. To everything, there is a season, a time, and a, a, a time to every purpose under heaven. A couple of things I like to talk about here. Number, letter A, balance your roles weekly. I like to take some time, normally, every Sunday afternoon, and sometimes it's Saturday afternoon, but I'll take time on the weekend there, about an hour, just to pray over the roles that God has given to me. And I have them listed out in a publication we've done now called the Stewarding Life Planner, uh, and I use that planner. And uh, I look at my roles. I'm a, I'm a Christian man. I'm a man of God. And I, I, I pray about that. Lord, how am I doing? And what do I need to do differently this week? And did I skimp in my devotions last week? I mean, I just kind of search my heart, Lord, and show me. And then I, I pray to be the right uh, husband. And I, I think about Terry and her needs and um, you know, sometimes, uh, I think about, in fact, two weeks ago on a Monday, we had a special date night plan and something came up at the church and boom, I had to get down to help a family and that, it just didn't happen. And so I've got to make that up. And that's why I take that time to stop and think about that role. And then I think about my children. I think about my grandchildren. And then I pray about my role as a pastor of a church. And I, I really, I really consternate over that, you know, and I, I kind of think about, okay, traveling out and and being at home, and the college, and all of this, and I, I want to be the pastor God's called me to be, and so uh, the, uh, the Lord sometimes puts things on my heart there, and then I pray about the college and these other things, but it's important for all of us to kind of pull back, and, and to take those roles that God has given to us, and maybe with a pencil in hand to write down what God speaks to us about in our time of prayer, balance those roles weekly, and then once you do that, letter B, identify your top priorities for the week. Without an action plan, you become a prisoner of events, but with an action plan, your events begin to have purpose. And so um, I like to take those things the Lord put on my heart in that prayer time and then just write those down. Uh, I fear for young men in ministry who do not have a written plan going into the week. They really don't know where they're going. 
uh, right here on this iPad, I have several of those categories and those roles, and I write down things on every separate page for those particular roles because I want to make sure that those things are getting on the calendar, getting done, and that that week will be accomplishing and influencing according to the will of God. Letter C, uh, I create the week at a glance. So I have this time of prayer. I write down what the Lord has put on my heart, then the week at a glance, and I write those things down on that week at a glance. It might be a hospital visit. It might be a uh, it might be a time with Terry. It might be a sermon that I've I got to get out of my normal series and preach on this. Whatever the Lord's putting on my heart. And uh, I list the top priorities. I list the appointments out. I create a format that can be followed. Then, uh, letter D, I want to work the God-given plan. I want to work the God-given plan. Um, I'm going to discipline myself for that plan. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I uh, am, am, am prioritizing and checking off and getting those things done. And it's so important. Now you say, well, what does this have to do with influence? Everything. If you cannot keep an ordered life and get those things done that God is putting on your, life, on your heart, you're not going to maintain influence. No one respects someone that can't remember what to do. You know, I remember one time I was 21 years old. I started uh, into the ministry, and, and a man came up to me, and he said, Brother Chapel, I need some Life of Christ curriculum for my Sunday school class. I was over at Sunday school. Well, I ordered it, you know, and, and uh, 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 had it for him later in the week, and I, I gave it to him at Saturday at church, and this was, a, this was an IBM executive, and he looked at me, and he got tears in the corner of his eyes, and he said, you don't know how many young assistant pastors I have asked for things like this and never gotten them. He said, you'll never know how much that means to me. Now, that executive became one of my biggest fans in the ministry and I had influence with him simply because I was living an ordered life, simple things like writing something down, putting it on the calendar, getting it done. If you live an ordered life, you enhance the opportunities to influence others down the road. And uh, that's something that, look at, I can, I can hire someone and give them a title, but I can't give them influence. This, this influence is something that's given by God and developed in our daily lives. So letter E. Then once you have this calendar made and, and you have this plan in order, exercise integrity at the moment of choice. Let's say that together. Exercise integrity at the moment of choice. Now I think, I, I think that phrase there actually comes from a secular book by Stephen Covey, but it's an excellent phrase. Exercise integrity at the moment of choice. Here's what I mean. You have said in your weekly plan I'm going to study 20 hours this week in the Word of God. And sometimes the Lord puts that in my heart. More time in study. Right? Then something comes up and, and someone says, look at this on the Internet. And then you're going to look at this on the Internet and this. And before you know it, you've spent hours researching something that doesn't relate to what God told you. And so you've got to exercise integrity at that moment of choice to do the thing that you know is the right thing. Well, James, where, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. So make the choices based upon what God has already told you to do and set aside the other things uh, that can come into the way. All right, number three. If we're going to have maximum influence in the local church, then we must mentor our team constantly. Mentor your team constantly. Now, uh, the team that God has given to you may be lay leaders, it may be teenagers, it may be a staff, uh, but God has called you to influence and to bring them uh, on their way to another level of usefulness for the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 4, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and teachers, you know it, uh, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. That's our way of influencing as a church grows is through the team that labors with us. And so God wants us uh, who, who are living an ordered life to help others live an ordered life. And if I cannot live an ordered life, uh, I certainly cannot help someone else to do that. Now, now I've, had, I've had people that, uh, you know, come into our ministry as lay people or staff, and they think they've already uh, learned enough in this area of how to order and how to implement and how to get things done. But let me tell you something. I'm still a student. I have not yet apprehended. And so I'm constantly reading, constantly trying to do better. Uh, I think I read probably 20 books this summer, and two or three of them were on administration. Why? Because 
uh, I have more to do now than I've ever had to do, and I want to continue to sharpen. And a lot of these things that I read, I'm going to, again, highlight, jot down, and bring into the staff meetings and help people along the way. So I want to mentor uh, folks along the way. Let me give you three things your team needs. Letter A, they need your attention. They need your attention. This is why I study the tension of my schedule because if it's pulling me away too much and I'm not able to mentor someone, then I've got to come back to my primary responsibility. Your church needs your attention. Um, I was talking with Brother Howell this morning. Brother willett has been on the road preaching for many years, but he's had this amazing ability to pastor the church and to do it very, very effectively. I've been with him many times when he's been on the phone, praying, talking to someone. He'll schedule his flights to get out first to a hospital to visit someone. Uh, that, that's a gift. It's a, it's a gift God's given to him. But we all have to say, Lord, help me uh, to have the influence in the body that you want me to have to give the attention that people need. Letter B, they need acceptance. They need acceptance. Now, this is an interesting uh, point here because those of us that are busy and, and uh, a lot of what we do is we delegate. We need to get this done. We need to get this done. By the way, any uh, staff member that's worth their salt, they understand. They're there to lighten the load of the pastor. They're not going to be grudged, you know, the fact that they're being given some things to do. That's why they are on that staff. They're there to be given things to do. The, the dilemma comes when if in the giving things to do there's not on the other side of that a counterbalancing of understanding the context of that is the love and appreciation for the person that you're giving the things to do or the fact that you appreciate them being on the team and sometimes that's an area that uh, that all of us can can come to and I've had to come to in my life and say look at I'm good at giving orders But am I good at appreciating the one that's getting the orders? So they need acceptance I like to say and I've said it here several times But acceptance is the optimum environment for growth and when people understand your love whether it's your wife or your teenager uh, They're gonna take the orders a lot easier, right? And so when you think about this matter of, of mentoring people need attention and then secondly, they need acceptance. And thirdly, they need assistance. Now, this is such a great verse. I, I just want you to, is it in your notes, Philippians 4, 9? Not in the notes. Turn, it, turn in your Bible there real quickly. This is, this is my favorite uh, mentoring passage and a passage that I think is one of the great Christian education passages as well, Philippians 4, 9. You'll know it the minute you see it. But it's a great mentoring passage. It says this, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you right so let's read that together ready begin those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do so here you have the process of hearing it here you have the process of experiencing it here you have the process of doing it you've heard the, the old statement that goes something like this tell me and I'll forget right right show me and I'll remember involve me and I'll what understand now that's why I'm such a proponent of the local church based Bible college because we have students that are coming in they're hearing the instruction but they're involved in the ministry with us they're going out soul winning they're standing in the, in the classrooms, they're working, involving themselves in uh, whether it's a church plant or an extension ministry or whatever. And, and, and I recognize churches that or colleges that are not under a church have great ministry experiences. But what I'm saying is students need to be involved if they're going to actually understand the ministry. And so what we want to do uh, when we're training someone and trying to have influence with them, whether it's soul winning, 2 Timothy 2.2, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the bus ministry going out with them, whether it's constructing a message, whatever it is, taking the time, because ultimately, pastors, the way to influence your whole community is going to be through those people that you're training. Uh, we can't do it all ourselves. So uh, when I went to Lancaster 33 years ago, our soul winning theme verse was not Matthew 28, it was 2 Timothy 2.2. I intentionally determined to train others also and to train others who could teach others also. And since that time, we've trained thousands of people in soul winning uh, because of that philosophy that we wanted uh, them to pick up that mantle as well. So mentor your team constantly. Uh, number four, confront the indifferent team member. 
confront the indifferent team member. You know what I've noticed is that for, for every step we take forward trying to influence for good and for God, uh, there are going to be those that are pushing back. You know, I don't really like that term. We hear a lot of this. People, people say, well, millennials like to push back. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a leader that really appreciates a lot of pushback. I, I like to let's get all on the same side and push in the same direction. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but I understand we need to have a climate to have discussions and so forth. I'm just not one of these guys that's into discussions ad nauseum and getting nothing done. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Amen. So I'll push back and say, all right, go soul winning, see you later. You know? and, uh, because it's just not, the, the whole idea of let's just push back on the leader uh, is not the fundamental job of the follower, right? It, I think it's something like holding up his arms in ministry, right? I think that's sort of why you're there. Um, and so, but there's a, there's a healthy pushback is what I'm trying to say in the sense of, hey, pastor, did you know that that class is already set up for a banquet and I don't know, you might want to use this other one. There's, there's ways to have constructive conversations that way, but there's this other kind of pushback in the ministry and it's a negative soul, it's a, it's a scornful person and, and sometimes we've had that in the church, sometimes we've even had it some in the Bible college where you'll get a student and they're not a heretic necessarily, but they're absolutely scornful and their influence is spreading. And along the way, you, you're going to have situations in leadership where it's like, look at either that kid on the back row is going to influence this class or I'm going to influence this class, right? Uh, that deacon that spoke up so negatively, he's going to, he's going to draw this or, or God's going to use me. So sometimes I, and I, I was even telling our church Sunday night, I was kind of preaching on uh, the fact that there's, there's always things that need to be taken care of and and uh, that, that uh, we always need to have wisdom and patience. And I was kind of teasing. One lady actually said to me, I, I had a, a staff member some time ago that just was going off the rails, and, and I could kind of sense it. I was kind of restraining him back, but he was doing some things that I would not have wanted him to do in our church. And so I knew that he was leaving. So I was kind of, you know, giving him a little, a little leeway because I knew he was leaving. And uh, he did a couple things right before he left that, that I was not pleased with, and then he left. Well, I had a lady come up to me and she said, uh, man, I'm so glad he's gone. And I said, well, praise the Lord. You know? <laughs> and, she, and I said, she said, why were you so patient with him? I said, well, probably partly because I knew he was leaving. She said, you should have fired him, she told me. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, I, cert I certainly could have done that. Um, but uh, I didn't feel led of the Lord to do it. So I was just saying, I didn't give that whole story Sunday night, but I just said, uh, I, I said, someone once told me I should fire someone, and I said, thank God that someone's not the pastor here. What I was trying to say is that, you know, there's a way to deal with it. But one of the hardest things to do for me in the ministry is to go to someone that's been a member for a long time or someone that's in leadership who's now either philosophically drifting or now they are not as faithful as they once were when they said they were going to be a deacon or whatever and going to them and saying, you know, Joe, what's going on, you know? And uh, that stuff you put on Facebook or, you know, you haven't been in church much lately. Those are not easy meetings. And you've got to have them in the spirit and you've got to have them at the right time. But if you fail to have them, someone else is going to start influencing that church. Because your standard is not what you put on paper. It's what you allow in behavior. So if the behavior is trending away from the way you're trying to influence and you're allowing it, you're losing influence. Right? So... We've got to confront them. Now, Proverbs 21, 22, when the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise, and when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. I don't know about you, I never rejoice in, in casting out a scorner. I mean, I don't go, oh, good, boom, I have the authority, I exercised it, good riddance. I, I, I always feel bad to lose anybody. You know, we, we have, we have 9,000 members in our church, and if, if I lose one of them next week, it's going to burden me. Because I'm a God-called man that loves people. I, I, these guys say, well, we had a back, back door revival, praise the Lord. They don't mean that. It never feels good. And, uh, but i tell you what. I'm going to have to deal with situations that are drawing away or negative or hurting the influence of the church. And so, uh, just a couple thoughts on that. Letter A. Uh, Work through a supervisor if it's in that case of a supervisor on this. And um, I've been mentoring, we mentor a lot of young men in our ministry. I've been mentoring Brother Gabe Rule in this. He's our executive pastor. And so he was telling me, 
the other day about someone that on staff, we have, we have about 300 staff members, and he was saying this one staff member violated this one policy, and he, he was kind of like troubled about it. Like, this happened. I said, you're the executive pastor. Go talk to his supervisor and go talk to the guy and take care of it. You know? And I said, here's how to do that. Here's what to say and here's what to document. And, uh, and it was an opportunity for me to mentor him on how to take care of that. And, and what I'm saying is that if you, as the senior pastor, we just dealt with Thomas Shepard this morning, one of, our, uh, one of our faculty members, and he assists me in the college. We dealt with some things the last couple weeks in the college. And uh, I told, the first thing I said to them was, we're going to search out the whole matter. That was the first thing I said. And that took about a week. And I said, the second thing we're going to do here is, I'm not going to deal with any of it. You guys are going to deal with it. Why? Because there were direct uh, lines of supervision in their life. And if you jump over and take care of everything that maybe is going on in the choir, you're really limiting the development of your choir director. You're really limiting your youth pastor, whoever. So, so work through, in, in the case of a teenager, we always work with parents. We always work with parents. Something that I frankly had to drill into Jim Shetler because he was from a parachurch college was the whole idea of working with the local church. Bible colleges have a terrible way of dealing with kids that are struggling financially or struggling in behavioral issues and never coordinating with home pastors. And that's a pet peeve of mine. We are not going to do, because I know, look at, I, we, have, we have kids in other Bible colleges right now. We have kids at Pensacola. We have, we have people, kids that want to you know, take engineering, whatever. And I understand that. But if one of them is in trouble or one of them is in financial trouble and I'm not ever told about it, that bothers me, right? Because I sent them there as an under-shepherd. I entrust them. They're from our flock. Listen, I held them in dedication. I led their parents to Christ. If they're in trouble, somebody ought to let me know they're in trouble and respect, you know? And we saw this in other colleges in the past that they kind of got the idea that we're the pinnacle, so we made the decision. So my, my point is this. Whenever we have a student that's struggling, or maybe he's going to have to be financially withdrawn, I've told Brother Shetler this many times. He does it greatly now. He's one of the greatest men of God I've ever worked with, by the way. But I just always say, Brother Jim, call that pastor. And I'll ask him this in staff meeting. Brother Thomas has heard me. I'll say, who's the pastor? I don't know. And he always puts his head down and goes, I'm going to find out. I, I knew. <laughs> and, and I'll say, okay, call the pastor before you have that meeting with that kid. And sometimes we call the parents. And there's a little bit of a touchy there legally. There's some certain things, certain laws involved with that. But uh, in most instances, we do call the parents. And we want them to know, hey, here's what's going on. Partly because we're hoping they'll pay that bill. Amen. You understand what I'm talking about, if it's a financial thing. What are we talking about? We're talking about when you deal with a problem, because you, you want to maintain influence, this kid's a problem in the school or this person's a problem in the church, Work with the authorities in their life and, and, and do your best uh, uh, to involve those that are God-given authorities. Letter B, confront kindly. People with a sharp tongue often cut their own throat. Second, and thirdly, know what is non-negotiable. Know what is non-negotiable. Opinions are what we hold. Convictions are what hold us. Right? Letter D, be willing to endure hardship or slander. Right? So, periodically I'll make some decision, and it may be with the church, and it may be with the college, and I know that not everyone's going to be happy with this decision. And I count that cost, but for the